Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 30 is the text that my good friend and brother Joab from my church just read to you. We like to let him read scripture and pray as much as possible. Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to verse 38, I want to talk to you about the cross-centered life. The cross-centered life. And it is, once again, a great honor to be here with, with this family and uh, to visit with you guys. And a great honor to preach the scriptures this morning. Kimberly and I have been trying to teach our kids uh, various uh, doctrinal truths, so we started to teach them the I am statements, and so we were showing off our kids the other day in church, and one of my kids uh, started rattling through the I am's. I am the bread of life, she said. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am Abraham Lincoln. And <laughs> it's, no, 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 that one's not right. Um, we, we've got some work to do, um, trying to teach them who the person of Christ is. And that's really the question throughout Mark's gospel. Who is Jesus Christ? It's been presented to us from the very beginning of the book. We looked at chapter 5 in particular last week. And in the opening chapters of Mark's gospel, they are looking at him. They're confused by him. He's healing the sick. He's teaching with authority. He's casting out demons. He's, uh, he's performing miracles. And at the end of chapter 4, after he calms the storm, the disciples look at themselves and they say, What sort of man is this? And now the same question is posed here in Caesarea Philippi, uh, the location from which you saw the video. In Mark chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus takes his disciples up and, and he begins to uh, talk to them about uh, who people say he is and what that means for their lives. Several years ago, one of the world's renowned scholars of the classics, Dr. E. V. Rue, completed a wonderful translation of Homer into English. The Penguin uh, publishers were so impressed with this, they asked him to then translate the Gospels. Now, Rue had been a committed agnostic. He was 60 years of age, and when his son heard that he was going to translate the Gospels, his son said, it will be interesting to see what Father will make of the four Gospels. It will be even more interesting to see what the four Gospels will make of Father. And a year later, Rue was convinced and gloriously converted to Jesus Christ and went on to join the Church of England. J.B. Phillips of the Phillips Translation interviewed him, and he asked him some questions. He said, did you not get the feeling that the whole material was extraordinarily alive? Rue replied, I got the deepest feeling. My work changed me. I came to the conclusion that these words bear the seal of the Son of Man and God. Phillips concluded, I found it particularly thrilling to hear a man who is a scholar of the first rank, as well as a man of wisdom and experience, openly admitting that these words written long ago were alive with power. Bore to him, as to me, the ring of truth. And I would commend to you this process of telling skeptics, agnostics, to simply read the Gospels for themselves. I heard recently of a pastor who had a, had a guy approach him, and he said, you know what, pastor? He said, if you would present to me a watertight argument for the existence of God, for belief in God, I would believe. And he said, what if God hasn't given us a watertight argument, but he's given us a watertight person against whom there can be no argument? And so this pastor regularly commends to the skeptics the simple reading of the scriptures. Now you say, we've had a guy in here recently that, has read the scriptures. He doesn't believe. Well, we're going to say something about that later. <laughs> but it does work. And I'll tell you some about that in a minute. Now, in Mark's gospel, this question, who is Jesus Christ, is followed by two other questions I think we could present. The first or second is, what did Jesus come to do? And the third is, what does Jesus call us to do? So we have three movements here from verses 27 to verse 38. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? And what does he call us to do? And this is very, very important. The section begins in verse 27. It says, Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you, you, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged him to tell no one about him. Now, Caesarea Philippi is a beautiful location. And I hope that you could all visit uh, the Holy Land at some point in your pilgrimage. 
I've had the great blessing, privilege of going with, with this seminary on a couple of occasions. And back in October, uh, we took our church to Israel. We also took one of the professors here, my good friend, Dr. Bill Warren, who roommate. That wasn't as good as the sites, but it was, it was still really, really nice. And, and Dr. Warren uh, is, is very, very uh, you know, scholarly in his background, and it was great because he would teach our, our church members about all these locations and all the nuances of the text, and then I would step in front of the camera, and I would say just what Dr. Warren said, and we would show that to our people. It was like living with a commentary, you know, uh, like a good commentary, and, and, and I, I love this, this whole experience. And I should add that, that Dr. Warren did not tell me that, that pigs had fangs. That, that was my mistake yesterday. Uh, I've been corrected numerous occasions. But we, we, we went up to Caesarea Philippi, and this is in the northern country, right? It's, it's uh, some 25 miles north of Galilee, and, and, and Jesus has his disciples, and he, he's uh, getting them away, and he's beginning to ask them these questions. And this is a very important location because in the Gospel of Mark, this is like a pivotal section in the Gospel. The intensity is about... And Jesus is on his way to the cross, and it falls within a section of Mark from chapters 8 to 10 that is a real discipleship-oriented section. We have some of the greatest sections here in these uh, few chapters about what it means to follow Jesus. Now, how we respond to this question of who is Jesus will really determine what we do with Jesus. It will determine how we live, how we die. And so the culture has an answer, and there's a correct answer. He asked Peter, who do people say that I am? What's the culture's answer, Peter? And he says, well, some say John the Baptist. Some think you're, 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 you're a freaky little cousin, you know, John the Baptist. You're a thunderous preacher of repentance, like Herod Antipas thought. Or some think you're Elijah. You're like a miracle worker. You're this, this eschatological figure that's going to bring about Messiah. Matthew adds, perhaps you're Jeremiah. You're a weeping prophet. We see you crying over people and weeping over their sins. Or one of the prophets. Now, all of these were positive views of Jesus, weren't they? They weren't necessarily negative views of Jesus. They were simply inadequate views of Jesus. They're inaccurate views of Jesus. And today, we still have this common spirit, right? That, by and large, the people I run into, at least, aren't necessarily negative toward Jesus. They just don't have an elevated view of Jesus. They have in, incorrect views of Jesus. Jesus was a thundering prophet of repentance. Jesus was a miracle-working prophet. Jesus was a weeping prophet, but he was more. He was more. Now, we've had answers throughout the, the history of the church, and even presently we find people with answers like Robert Funk of the Jesus Seminar that said Jesus was basically a witty teacher a lot like Buddha or Socrates. He called him a subversive sage. There are another that was here Friday, who says basically Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet who thought his end was coming in his day, and he was apparently wrong. There are some who think Jesus was simply a prophet, like in Islam. He's a prophet inferior to Jesus, or Jesus is a prophet inferior to Muhammad. A guy named Eric Meek of American Islamic Relations told a group of students at University of North Texas, if Jesus were here, he'd be a Muslim. There are a lot of people who believe that Jesus was a good man, but he wasn't the God-man, like Gandhi, who said, I cannot attribute exclusive divinity to Jesus. He is as divine as Krishna or Rama or Muhammad or Zoroaster. Susan Haskins said Jesus was a, quote, feminist. Gorbachev said Jesus was the first socialist. In Scientology, they say, quote, Jesus is an implant forced upon a theton about a million years ago. Whatever that means. <laughs> I just wrote it down. We ever meet Tom Cruise, we'll ask him uh, what that means. They're leading theologian. The Lakota tribe says that Jesus is the buffalo calf of God. In pop culture, he's a homeboy. He's in movies. He is in The Simpsons. In Talladega Nights, it's the eight-ounce baby Jesus in the golden fleece diaper. The baseball movie Major League, there's a discussion about whether or not Jesus can help you hit a curveball. So Jesus is popular. Jesus is out there. People have opinions. He's been called the man you can't ignore. You've got to do something with Jesus. Now, there is something that's probably even more dangerous to us who minister in a church. I would call him Bible Belt Jesus. Now, Bible Belt Jesus doesn't really want us to deny ourselves. Right? He really doesn't want us to, to, to deny comforts. He really would not call us to go to a hard place. He, he is really okay with us never doing anything dangerous or risky. That's way more dangerous, I think. And 
way too common. In all of these views, people have a Plato Jesus. They just want to define Jesus in their own image. It's been rightly said that man or God created man in his own image and man has returned the favor. And we cannot do that, with right? So the culture has an answer. Now, Peter actually gets one right. <laughs> he did well this day, right? Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter speaks up and the you here is emphasized, right? You, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? So Peter opens his big mouth. He takes his foot out of his mouth. And all the angels hold their breath as this guy opens his mouth. And Peter says, you are the Christ. Now Peter would just stopped here, right? The rest of the day, it would have been a good day. But he did get it right, at least at this point. You are the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. You're not just a king. You're the king to end all kings. You're the Christ. Now, again, this is difficult in our culture, right? Because everyone will tolerate everything you do except be intolerant of the belief that there's only one way, that there are multiple ways to God, this exclusive claim that we possess. So they say, you know, can't we all be? And we can't. If Muslims say Jesus wasn't crucified, we say he was, both are not correct. If the Jewish people say he was not the Messiah, we say he was the Messiah, I can figure that out. We can't both be correct. If Hinduism says there were multiple incarnations, we say, no, there was one. We can't both be correct, can we? You are the Christ. You're the only Christ. Now, what, I, what we, we probably should mention at this point, of course, is when Peter gets this right, Matthew tells us why. He says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, right? But God in his grace has done so. And this is why some can read the Gospels and be converted, and then it seems that some can and they're not converted. That they have, their hearts are hardened, right? And so Peter here has, experiences the grace of God. In fact, I think the parable above it, it's actually a story, chapter 8, verse 22 to 26, is an active story. It's like, a, it's like an active parable that Jesus touches this guy, and he, he sees men walking around. They look like trees. He touches them again, and he can see clearly I think this was the disciples that, that they could get part A correct. He is the Christ. They could not get question two correct. What kind of Christ is he? But God is revealing Christ to them, right? He, he's, he's opening their eyes. And that's the good news. That God in his grace opens our eyes. And we should pray for God to open people's eyes. Paul did so, didn't he? In Ephesians chapter 1 when he said, May the eyes of your heart be enlightened. So chapter 8, verse 22 to 25 and 6 shows us a picture of a physical sight. Here we see a picture of spiritual sight. It's not just your eyes that, that see, it's your heart also that sees. And the good news around the world today is God is opening eyes. Particulums all around the world. I had the most interesting phone call the other day from a friend of mine named Mike. You, will not, you couldn't really make this type of story up. Mike was in a quartet with the second baseman that led me to Christ in college back in the day called God's Own. And I had not heard from Mike in a long time, probably 10 years. And come to find out, after he graduated, he went to pastor a church in the metropolis of Pine Knot, Kentucky. I'm sure you've all heard of Pine Knot. And after he was there for a little while, he was a single guy, his friend told him of a website. He could go find him a Christian girl. I'm sorry, I didn't write the, the website down uh, for you guys. Sure, you could Google it. But he found, finds this girl, and she's from Australia. So he begins to correspond with, with uh, this Australian gal, and they end up getting married. Now he pastors in Sydney, Australia. He went from Pine Knot to Sydney. And the last time I heard from him, he, had, he didn't have, really have a hillbilly accent, but a freaky accent either. And when he said hello, he had a full Australian accent. And he was asking me to come over and preach and do this and that. And so as we were talking, I said, Mike, have you seen anyone come to Christ? He said, yes, we just baptized three Muslims. I'm like, what a story. He's yeah, from Pine Knot, Kentucky. He marries an Australian girl whom he meets on the Internet. He's pastoring in Sydney, Australia, and his three converts are Muslims. Not only Muslims, they're from a, a part of the world I, I, I probably shouldn't mention because it's illegal. And he says, on one Sunday, they, they walk into the church, or at the doors of the church, and they say, can someone tell us about Jesus Christ? <laughs> and he's like, come on in. Come on in. 
Has another guy comes by later, he says, that same week, and says, uh, I want to know everything about Jesus Christ. I'm searching out all the religions. Where I'm from, we can't even do a Google search of Jesus on the Internet. It's illegal. He, all his friends are coming to faith in Christ. His Muslim wants to understand what's going on. And so Mike is, is baptizing uh, these Muslims. What's going on? God's opening eyes. And they're confessing that Jesus is not just a prophet. He is the Christ. One of our old librarians, he wasn't a librarian, he worked in the library, Nashad Abraham, doing ministry among Muslims right now in D.C. He told a wonderful story recently. He said one of the guys in the neighborhood where he was ministering came up to him and he said, I'm having dreams. I wonder if you can help me. I keep hearing this phrase, I am. Who is I am? What is I am? And the shot said, you do not encounter this type of evangelism without intense prayer and fasting. And he gave him the gospel of John, told him to read the gospels. And he came back and he said those same phrases, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. We're in my dreams. God is opening up eyes in his grace. This is with two applications before we move on. Number one, the question I believe in personal evangelism is, who is Jesus Christ? Do not get sidetracked. I get people come into my office regularly, skeptics, agnostics, many of whom grew up in a church, walked away, rebelled from God, now don't say they believe in God, and they will want to ask you about everything under the sun. Did Adam have a belly button? Did, what about dinosaurs? And all of these things, red herrings. I left one guy recently, after we talked for an hour, I said, dude, the main question for you is really simple. Who is Jesus? And he said, well, can I be a Christian and not believe in Christ? He really asked me that. And so I was like, hey, <laughs> I, I don't want to be Captain Obvious here, but Christianity is about Christ. I don't want to push it too far, okay? It's like playing baseball and saying, do we have to play with the base? It's all right. It's Christianity. It's Christ, okay? Second application here is present him prayerfully as you present him and do present him. We see this beautiful picture in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 to 6. Verse 4, verse 6, we see eye, eye language. De the devil blinds people. Verse 6, God opens eyes. Shines in people's hearts. Verse 5, what happens? We proclaim him. As we proclaim him, right? God in his mercy opens their eyes. And so Peter here experiences this, but he still needs some more help. It says in verse 30, he tells them not to tell anyone about him because at this point they were still, they were still foggy. They still needed clarity. And so we move to the second question, what did Jesus come to do? What did Jesus come to do? And we see here the purpose of Jesus explicitly stated in verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Now, he actually says it three times. There are three predictions of Jesus' death and resurrection. That's very important because Mark, as we noted yesterday, is a short gospel. It's moving quickly. It's the 24 of the Gospels. It's just boom, boom, boom. He's not just wanting to insert material. So if he does something three times, as he does in chapter 9, verse 30 to 32, and chapter 10, verse 32 to 34, this prediction, it's important to him. It's important to Jesus. It's important because it's central in all of human history. Mark wants us to know this. This is the purpose of Jesus. He came to suffer many things, to be killed, and on three days rise again. In each of these three predictions, we see a couple commonalities. We see that his death would include suffering, that his death would be intentional, it would be by the hands of religious leaders, who would be in the tomb for three days, and that he would rise again. It's a great prediction that you can predict your own resurrection. And one of the very important words in theology is this little word, must. He must suffer many things. Jesus is basically saying, not just, I'm going to die, I have to die. I have to give my life as a ransom. I have to lay down my life. Either he would suffer or we would suffer. And we see here, all of this is leading up to the climactic verse in Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 45 that he came not to uh, be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
And so Jesus is coming to meet our greatest need, that of a Savior. Now, eventually the disciples would get it, and eventually this would be the central message of the disciples, where Paul would say, I have resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Peter would stand up on the day of Pentecost, and he would proclaim, you put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. And I would commend to you this very, very obvious thing, since we're talking about obvious things today. Preach the gospel every week in your church. Every week. We have a tendency to flirt around with peripheral things. And we need to make sure that we're keeping the gospel central in everything we're doing. You think about it. You've got maybe, what, 45 weeks with average church member, maybe, if, if that's, that's high, probably. And you've got them probably for about 30 minutes. Most of them are only coming once a week. What are you going to give them? What are you going to give them? Resolve? Does that mean we talk about nothing else? No, we're talking about we teach them how to view all of life through the gospel. We point everything to the gospel, right? And we have this culture that is being fed moralistic, therapeutic deism. Nice wants you to be nice. God will welcome everyone into heaven. All of these things keep the main things, the plain things. The plain things, the main things. Jesus said this plainly. Let's keep saying it plainly until we see Jesus. Some say, won't this get old? People hearing the gospel every week? Listen. It doesn't get old when my wife tells me she loves me. Especially when I'm gone six days. I go back home. I don't think I will ever, if I do, she probably should just punch me in the neck. Uh, I've heard that before, baby. You told me when we got married. I don't need to hear that anymore. To tell your people, to remind your people every week of the gospel and for unbelievers to hear it. This is our task, right? This is our task. And so let's be about this business, okay? Now, Peter wants to take Jesus aside because perhaps Peter thought he was hot. He got one right. Now I'm on a roll. I instruct the rabbi here. I'm going to instruct the Messiah on what kind of Messiah he's supposed to be. So he takes him aside, and it says Peter actually began to rebuke Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus is so patient, isn't he? He's so gracious. We're glad he's gracious. And Peter decides basically to explain the Old Testament to Jesus and, and tell him what kind of Messiah he is supposed to be. And what you see when Jesus turns to Peter, he rebukes him, and he's really uh, 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 referring to all of them, is that they were probably all having this discussion, but it was Peter that was sort of like the errand boy. They remind me of a lot of little middle schoolers who smell like Axe body spray and they're hyped up on monster drinks. And, 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 and so Peter goes over. Now what Peter and the others had probably been told is that, that, that Messiah was going to come, he was going to be a conquering king. They'd read Isaiah, for instance, where he's going to have the government on his shoulders. They're looking for a king with the government on his shoulders. Jesus tells him he's a king with the cross on his shoulders. And that confused them. He calls himself the Son of Man in verse 31. He calls himself the Son of Man in verse 38. They knew that phrase as well. It was really hard for these guys, I think, to put the, the pieces together. That he was coming in glory. He was going to be this, this wonderful, glorious king. But he's going to suffer. And they were familiar with suffering passages probably. But it was hard to put them together. In fact, what we read in some of the Dead Sea communities, they, they were anticipating two messiahs. A suffering one and a glorious Son of Man one. And so he begins to take Jesus to the side, and he, he tells them, you know, I, I didn't need to tell you what you're supposed to be doing. I don't really like all this cross language. I like the Messiah part, but I really don't like how you're going to go about doing it. And so Jesus has to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't think Peter was Satan here, but he does see the influence of Satan in Peter, right? And what I think is going on here is the simple fact that the cross was cosmic, this was a war. Satan doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross. He's tried to hinder him earlier in the wilderness. And now we're getting closer and closer and closer. And Peter begins to pipe up and Jesus has to tell him, get behind me, you're setting your, your, your thoughts on the things of man. And so we see here, Jesus came to do this. Let's keep telling people what Jesus came to do. Because we're going to have these occasions where we have church members in particular who come up to us and say, Pastor, why don't you preach about something else? 
I had one ask me recently, are you going to address how Egypt fits into the end times? <laughs> I said, probably not. I'm like, well, why? I'm like, I don't know how they fit. Do you? I mean, I'm willing to have a discussion about it. And I'm sure everything's moving somewhere. I do know that. I know how Egypt. I've been to Egypt for eight hours. And, you know, I've explored Egypt enough. Uh, Eight hours is enough for me. Uh, but you'll have these occasions, and what I've decided to do is to base my preaching on history and not speculation. Base it on completed facts that we know. We do know some things about future, namely Jesus is coming back. But let's be very, very careful here. We need prophets that stay on the center of things. We need prophets for the center, and the gospel is the center. So keep doing that. Number three, what does Jesus call us to do? I'm out of time, but you know the text pretty well, so let me move quickly. He calls us to do three things. He says that we are to die, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Jesus basically says, if you're going to follow me, I'm going to a cross, and you must go to a cross. We must all go on the Calvary road. Everything about, about us wants to reject or redefine this phrase, deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow me. Heard of a lady recently who told her pastor, Pastor, pray for me. I'm having a hard time keeping my acrylic nails on my finger. But we all have to carry our cross, don't we, Pastor? <laughs> I don't really think that's what Jesus was talking about. Do you? We have these crazy ideas what a cross is. What was a cross? It was death. It was death. Peter eventually went there, tradition tells us. Deny self. Take up a cross, he says. Follow me. Everything in our culture says love self, pamper self, exalt self. Jesus says deny self. It's much, much different, isn't it? The cross turns us into Christ exalters, not self exalters. And we live in the most comfort obsessed culture, perhaps in the world. Jesus says we must deny ourselves, we must take up our cross. What's that mean? What was a cross like? It was shameful at times. It was embarrassing at times. It involved reproach. It involved rejection. It involved persecution. It involved martyrdom. They spat on him. They ridiculed him. They accused him of things he was not guilty of. Take up your cross. And remember, he's the king. We don't negotiate with the king. But he's not just a king with authority, is he? He's a king also who loves. He's a king who's going to a cross. He loves you. He loves you. Who else are you going to lay down your life for? Because here's the thing. Everyone's making sacrifices for something. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Thirdly, he says, follow me. We follow our Savior by doing the things the Savior did. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to call sinners to repentance. He came to, that they may have life. He came to feed the sheep. Following Jesus means that we too are about this business of rescuing people, loving people, laying down our lives for the gospel. Eventually, Simon Peter embraced this, right? John chapter 21. He told Simon Peter that you're going to die basically on a cross. I love Peter's answer. What about John? <laughs> John the beloved. He says, don't worry about John. You worry about Peter. And he does. Now, notice what Jesus does here. Verse 34, there's a transition he calls the crowd. This is not just for the inner disciples. This is for everyone. In fact, he says, right, if anyone. This is for all believers. We don't have first tier and second tier team. It's not JV and varsity here. That the call to follow Jesus is not relegated to a few. The call to follow the mission of Jesus is not relegated to a few. There's really no missions department in the church. The church is a missions department. It's like the Braves saying, we need a baseball department. Right? We're called to this. Everyone, if anyone wants to follow me, this is what we must do. Now, we then ask the question, why? And you see the answers here. He gives you four fours. Four, if you want to save your life, this is what you do. If you want life, you lay down your life. It's the great paradox. He also adds, and Mark adds this, not only for my sake, he says, but for the gospel's sake. Why do we lay down our lives? Because of the gospel. We believe the gospel's worth it. The reason many don't care about missions is they don't have a gospel worth preaching. When you love the gospel, you see the need for the gospel, you'll lay down your life for the gospel. 
If anyone loves me for my sake, for the gospel's sake, lay down your life. Save your life. You find your life. That's literally what he says here. You find life. You won't find life until you lay down your life for Jesus. He's talking about identity here. The second four is mentioned here. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Consider the value of your soul. Everyone is making a sacrifice for something. What he's basically saying is people are sacrificing for money. What good is that? What good is a gold card in hell? It's no good. What good is that? There's no profit to that. And then he says, don't be ashamed of me. Verse 38, if you're ashamed of me, and I love how Mark says, and my words. Notice how he puts those two together. A lot of people who say, you know, I like Jesus, but I'm really ashamed of a few of these parts of the Bible. No, no, no. Don't be ashamed of his teaching. Embrace his teaching. Embrace Jesus. Embrace his teaching of this adulterous and sinful generation. He said, I'll be ashamed of you. Now, I can unpack a lot of those phrases. I preach a lot longer in my church, but I won't put you through that this morning. Let me just finish on one simple question. What kind of people does God use? You think about the needs around the world today. 1.7 billion unreached, 6,000, over 6,000 unreached people groups. I mentioned earlier, 140 million orphans. Two million children right now in brothels. The need for churches all over the world. 1.5 billion people who need access to medical care. 100 million slaves plus. And we look at the the enormity of this task and we say, "What, what can I do? Who am I? What kind of people does God use? And I would just say, look at these disciples. We looked at a madman yesterday. Levi, the tax collector. The type of people God uses is not necessarily gifted people, just just gifted people. It's people who are willing to lay down their lives for the gospel. That's the type of people. You, who are willing to lay down your life because of this. Daily we lay, and we say this world has nothing for us, and Christ is everything to us. That's the type of people that God uses. Do we need gifts? Yes. But listen, we're going to be accountable to the measure of gifting that God has given us. What God wants all of us equally to do is lay down our lives for the sake of this gospel. Why? Because of the reward. Look at this reward here. You find life. There's reward in heaven. You're living for something that matters. There's eternity in view. This sacrifice, is it a sacrifice in this life? Yes. But this is as close to hell as you'll ever be. For the Christian, this is as close to hell as you'll ever be. For the unbeliever, this is all of heaven that they'll ever get. This sacrifice, is it a sacrifice? Yes, but it's temporary. It's temporary. To live as Christ and to die is gain. That's why I love when John Patton went to be in the Hebrides. They said, you'll be eaten by cannibals. You know that story. And he said, you'll be eaten by worms. We're all going to die. And my body will arise in the likeness of our risen Christ just like yours. And when they continued opposing him, he said this, I'm already dead. And they can't kill a dead man. I was dead before I left. May we die to self. May we live unto Christ for the glory of his name. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for this community of faith I so dearly love. Lord, we don't want to lose our lives. And I believe that's why many are here in this place studying and teaching because you've called them to make their lives count for all of eternity. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you opened our eyes to confess you as Christ, the king to end all kings. And how we pray you would open up the eyes of those that we communicate with. And I pray you would grant us grace as we lay down our lives for the sake of this gospel and for your sake. We thank you for giving us a gospel that's worth preaching to the nations. And I pray you would call many out in this room to take the gospel to hard places. I pray that you would grant them favor, Lord. Make decisions plain to them. May you grant them wisdom and grace. Purge us from sin and self that we may live unto Christ wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.